OK, so let's start with what are threads. Now, threads are a really, really old idea. Um, they were fir the first reference that anyone I could find um, was all the way back in 1967 on a programming manual for the OS 360, which was an IBM room-sized room mainframe um, that was built around the idea of doing multiple things at once. It could batch process through huge amounts of data. Threads come all the way back from there, and they were difficult then. They've been getting gradually easier as you build better abstractions around them. They're an old idea. They're probably not a completely solved idea. They've been getting better all the time. You know, prior to threads um, in Unix, the uh, usual way to make a program run concurrently in the background was to call fork, which makes an entire copy of your process. One copy ex exits, one copy keeps running in the background, detached. Uh, forking is kind of an expensive process because you literally take a copy of the whole program. Um, with copy on write, forking became a lot cheaper. Now a thread is actually kind of similar because a thread executes in the same memory space as the rest of the program. Um, they still get their own entry in the operating system scheduler. They still have their own call stack. They still have their own state. And they're preemptively multitasked. So when a thread is executing at any time, literally any time, unless you've marked what's called a critical section, the thread might be interrupted by the operating system to switch context. At that point, the operating system grabs a snapshot of your execution state, so instruction pointer, register state, and similar, saves it, goes to whichever thread's taking control, restores their setup, pushes it back. And this, act this can happen uh, as frequently as every 16 microseconds, um, particularly on Intel chips and AMD chips, um, x86, x64. Um, context switching is quite cheap now. Um, on older ARM chips, it was pretty horrific, which led to some of the initial ARM systems going entirely with cooperative multitasking. Now, we're not going to be talking about async today because I've done quite a few webinars on async. I've done quite a few webinars on safety in general. Threads are heavier than async. You don't want to have tens of thousands of threads. You can have tens of thousands of async tasks. But modern Linux is really, really smart. And a lot of the uh, complaints you hear about threads, um, for example, your scheduler slows way down because you have so many threads, are much less true than they used to be. Linux is really good at marking this thread is waiting for this um, operation, this network operation, this disk operation. Let's not schedule it yet. Much better than it used to be. Macs and Windows, not quite so good, but still really good. And last I checked, I could spawn about 30,000 threads on my Linux desktop in the office before um, I started getting error messages. So threads are uh, an old school system. They are the fundamental building block. All of the async systems out there use threads. They're built right into your operating system. And Rust is basically exposing your operating system's API for creating threads. It's adding very little. This is a thin wrapper. You're not losing performance by using the Rust representation of threads. You are using your operating system's threads. So why are they difficult? Um, there's a meme being going around for a really, really long time. And this was the first tweet I could find of it. A programmer had a problem. So he thought to himself, I know I'll solve it with threads. Has now problems to he. I've also seen that with um, he now has 12 problems. And what does that mean in practice? It means that now you've taken something that was quite easy to reason about, a program that is running from top to bottom. So you're going step one, step two, step three. But now you've got all these threads that are running all at once. And just like you sitting at your desk, um, if someone comes along and interrupts your train of thought, you context switch. Now you pay them some attention, or hopefully you might just ignore them. Um, and then you have to context switch back to your program. And as most programmers will tell you, there is nothing worse than an uns unscheduled meeting in the middle of your busy time to throw you off. And that's exactly the same issue with threads, is that you can be interrupted at literally any time. If you haven't remembered to lock your uh, input-output thread, you end up with uh, your printed output has now problems to he. Well, each of those executed in a different order. 
and so gained access to the IO at different times, what's coming out doesn't even make sense. And with threads, you don't have a lot of control over the scheduling. You don't get to really say this thread will go now, this thread will go now, unless you start tying them together with sync primitives. The operating system handles that for you. And so threads can be hard to reason about. As humans, we like to think in terms of doing one thing at a time. Um, that's pretty normal, pretty common. Don't feel bad if you're one of those magical people that can do two things at a time. Um, my wife can. I really don't know how she does it. Um, it also gets difficult because you're sharing data between threads. And this can be dangerous. In previous webinars, we've talked about data races. We'll have a quick look at one in a moment. But basically, if two pieces, if two threads concurrently access the same piece of data and both try and change it, it's very unlikely, unless you've got some sort of locking primitive, that the that the answer you get is what you thought it would be. So you can be quietly corrupting your program in the background without ever knowing it. But thanks to threads, you're corrupting it really fast. It can be confusing too. Um, if you've gone with everybody's old favorite style of code where you have lots of global variables shared between threads, threads are writing to them all over the place, um, good luck ever debugging that. It's also very easy to make spaghetti because now you have threads that are all running independently. If they're all accessing different parts of the state of your program, it's almost impossible to figure out um, why did this variable gain this value? As Bill always likes to say, the best code is the code that you can read easily from one from top to bottom. He's absolutely right. And so when you're threading, it's quite important to uh, make sure that you avoid making spaghetti, avoid confusing yourself, and absolutely avoid danger. And lastly, threads are difficult because they don't always provide the magical speed up that you think they will. Um, it's actually surprisingly easy to write a threaded program that is slower than the single threaded version because CPU cache tends to keep a blob of memory, read through it, access it very fast. Um, if you suddenly need to synchronize that between all your CPUs, all your memory accesses just became a lot slower. And sometimes um, the 16 millisecond, sorry, 16 microsecond context switch between threads is actually slower than the amount of time it took to sort your million numbers. I mean, some of the sorting functions are incredibly fast. Threads aren't always going to take something and make it magically faster. Sometimes using the threads actually imposes more overhead than doing it the simple way. So you have to make sure you think about, do I need threads before you dive into this? OK, so first example, we've got, um, I called it an innocuous looking piece of C++. Um, I don't know how many of you use C++, but uh, my experience from using it professionally from 15 years was that the innocuous, safe looking stuff is usually where I'm going to have trouble. Uh, so we make a thread. And you'll notice the C++ syntax is a lot like the Rust syntax. There's a reason for that. Uh, Rust originated with Grayson Hoare and a team at Mozilla. Um, getting fed up with C++ and the problems it was causing them and trying to come up with something better. We make eight threads. Each of them prints hello world and the counter from zero to seven. And then we join the threads, which we'll talk about in a moment, but this is wait until the thread has executed. Looks great. You run it. There's a snapshot of the output there. Hello world, hello world, hello world 02, blank space, hello world six, hello world three, one. So sometimes we've got them we're getting the full output we want. Sometimes we're not. The first line, uh, you can see that uh, actually the printing process was interrupted by other threads before it even finished formatting everything else. It looks nothing like what we expected. It's completely harmless. We're not doing any damage here, but it's probably not what you wanted. Uh, it's worth noting that Rust, when you do print line, acquires a lock to standard output, so we won't do this. But this is a blessing and a curse, because it's a blessing in the sense that your threaded program printing out isn't going to give you gobbledygook. It's a curse in that uh, it means that print line is actually quite a bit slower than you might expect it to be. So if you write a program whose main purpose is printing huge amounts of text, you need to jump through a couple extra hoops to get the lock before you print all the text, because otherwise you're actually acquiring a mutex and releasing a mutex, which we're going to talk about in a moment, for every line that you print. So once again, Rust is making it a little safer. At the same time, Rust makes it a little slower here, unless you know what you're doing, so you have to be careful. Data races. One of the big things that Rust promises is that you won't get in 
data races. And we, um, if you go to the Art in the Lab YouTube channel, I have a couple of entire videos where I have talked about this in huge detail. So I'm not going to go into it very heavily today. But here's a simple Go program that runs 100 threads, each of which adds to a counter and then prints out the total. And you'll get a different answer every time. And the reason for that is that writing to an enter, in, incrementing an integer isn't a one-step task. Uh, it loads from memory, it adds to it, it stores it back into memory. And remember how threads can interrupt you at any moment? Well, it's quite possible that they'll interrupt you while you're loading, while you're adding, while you're storing. And so when you've got two threads that simultaneously load, each of them adds, and then all try to store, it's very unlikely that you're going to get the uh, um, answer that you expected. Now, <clears throat> quick note to the Go programmers out there, turn on your compiler's data race detection. It will spot this problem and won't make your life miserable. If you have code in production that you haven't checked for that, go ahead and check it because this is one of the most common problems out there. Um, Uber reported that they found um, tens of thousands of these bugs in critical code. Rust can't protect you from data races between services that um, call each other over the network. It will make sure that you don't have data races inside your program.